Hello, this is Michael Canfield, and thank you for joining us today on The Dog Watch. A dog watch is an evening shift of early or late duty, or the people who undertake it. This dog watch considers the natural world and the things that help us experience it, from dogs to watches and everything in between. Ultimately, it's a place for us to go wherever curiosity takes us. There is no more important first step when one heads to the field than to put on quality footwear. And many times, this means a great pair of boots. In my search for long-lasting, aesthetically pleasing, and comfortable footwear, I found Helm Boots of Austin, Texas. I got to know Brad Day, their CEO, and am grateful that he was willing to join us for a shift on the dog watch. In our conversation, Brad and I discuss his background and experiences in footwear, the development of the Helm Boot brand, and aspects of how boots are made. We also discuss how to choose a boot, some of the attributes of Helm's current offerings, as well as new styles that are in their pipeline. Our feature on this episode is endurance, which is both one of the core principles of Helm Boots and the ship that Ernest Shackleton took to Antarctica in 1914 in an attempt to be the first to cross that continent. Despite now lying under 3,000 meters of water in the Weddell Sea near Antarctica, the endurance is a symbol of perseverance, fortitude, and the human spirit. The expedition that bears its name is certainly one of the best exploring adventures of the modern era. The current location of the endurance was only recently discovered by the Endurance 22 expedition on March 5th, 2022. And now, let's turn to our conversation with Brad Day of Helm Boots. Hi Brad, thanks so much for joining us today on The Dog Watch. Well, thanks for having me, excited to be here. So, you're the CEO of Helm Boots, and you know we'll certainly discuss those boots in details. I have a lot of questions and interest in the particular particulars of the company, but I wanted to start by hearing a bit about your experience with shoes and boots, like your own experience and how you think about them. So before you came to Helm, I'm wondering if you could describe any sort of favorite shoes or boots and what they were and why you liked them. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny now kind of being fully immersed in fashion footwear. Um, you know, I have a, a new appreciation for things, but I wasn't always a, a shoe guy or a sneaker head or any of those things. I think for a lot of my career, like my, my passion around footwear has been more performance related. You know, what are the soccer shoes that I'm going to get, right? You know, having the, the best soccer shoes or, you know, whatever sport that I was kind of into at the time and, and really looking at um, what are the, you know, what are my icon athletes that I, that I, that I love, what are they wearing and stuff. And so, you know, I still remember the memories of getting, you know, the East Bay catalog or the Eurosport catalogs and kind of flipping through and, circling the next pair of shoes that I'd wanted. So, you know, my, my relationship with shoes is, is kind of really evolved of someone that, you know, loved them for sports. Right. And then someone who worked in the, in the, in the footwear industry for 16 years with it, with Adidas. Right. So going from kind of loving them to building them um, for, for other people. And then now toward the point where, um, you know, I really think that, having a, a good quality pair of shoes is like one of the fundamental foundations of kind of uh, your your attire, right? I mean, you kind yeah. of think about, you know, the confidence you get when you walk into a room or a wedding with a perfect suit and a, and a great haircut and, you know, your new watch on and, and, you know, shoes are just as important as that, right? You look down and it, it completes the outfit, right? So like, like the confidence you have. So, um, I, I certainly appreciate that um, now having kind of lived in this world for five years. And I think the other side of that is you really appreciate a, a good quality made product, right? The, the experience of getting a, a pair of boots and breaking them in and, and knowing that you're going to own them for 10, 20 years, but that they're going to kind of develop and, and craft to your foot and all that. So um, yeah, it's, it's really evolved as I've, you know, gotten older and, and more experienced and, and come to appreciate finer things. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I think that's the main reason I wanted to have you on and talk about Helm Boots as an example of a company that's doing those things that 
kind of um, honors the memo that boots are important or shoes are important, right? Both in the context of having a pair that's good quality that lasts a long time, because there's obviously a lot of um, shoes that just are there for fast fashion. They wear out and people throw them in a, a heap. Um, and the memo that shoes are important for your outfit, right? Like how you present yourself to the world that people really notice. And I, I didn't get that memo <laughs> until I was much older, right? And didn't realize that and had no idea that, you know, it was kind of an important part of how you present yourself. I just thought of shoes as, as pretty much utilitarian or comfort related. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of what I, I thought it'd be nice to talk about and, and hear your perspectives on from the maker's side. And before we do that, you mentioned your experience in footwear for 16 years, you said, with Adidas, et cetera. What did you learn about footwear at that point? Like, what are some of the lessons or things that when you look back that you really didn't know before you had that time that, say, I wouldn't have any idea about? And then what are those things did you bring when you came to Helm? Like, what do you feel like you've been able to apply from that experience? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the difference between Adidas, which is this massive organization that has every resource known to man available in terms of product and innovation versus whereas Helm, which is still in its infancy, are, are very different organizations. But I think the the biggest thing that I learned around Adidas uh, in, in my time in, in, in that industry was just the desire uh, for greatness, right? Like, if you're going to spend your time and you're going to build a product, do everything in your power to make it a quality product, right? And and that's very very different then to now, right? Because you might spend you know a year and a half making a you know hundred two hundred dollar soccer shoe, right? But you also spend the same amount of time building a fifty dollar soccer shoe or a twenty five dollar soccer shoe or a you know, $60 golf shoe. And like, regardless of, of how much you're going to charge for it, like take a lot of pride in, in building quality products because people, people understand and, and appreciate um, when, when you approach things that way. Right. So people can tell when you cut corners and, and as a small brand now, right. We, we can't afford that. Right. We've, we've got to make sure that every experience that somebody has with our products are a positive experience, right? And so being passionate about the quality that you build into your products and not cutting corners and and doing it the right way, regardless of whether that takes a little bit more time or is a little bit more expensive, right? Um, those things pay off in the long term. And so you kind of look at some of these, you know, start to finish projects when, when we were at Adidas, you know, it could take you 18 to 24 months to, to take an idea to actually get into market. Now, smaller brand, we can do that much faster, but I always have to remind myself of like, there's steps along the process that you have to do to make sure that the end consumer gets the best quality product for the money that they're, they're spending, right? And you have to make sure that you appreciate that people are spending their hard-earned money on a, on a product and they have expectations and not, not only do you have to live up to those expectation, expectations, you have to exceed them, right? If somebody expects to have a great boot, you know, you have to make it even beyond that. Yeah, it's it seems like that's an element, especially of the smaller brand in the sense that there's more to lose, right? Adidas can make right. a, a big push on some random sure. thing and, and it can flop and they'll still survive. but. I'm curious too, if you learned anything that surprised you or that was a sort of truth about how both people think about shoes, like how, from someone that makes shoes or is in the shoe industry, how do they look at people and think, this is how people think about shoes? Like, what, what do you know about that? And then also feet, like, what do you know about like how people's feet fit into shoes in the sense that like, what are the important truths that you have to deal with in that context as well that are general, any generalities you, you can talk about? Sure. I, well, I think the, the simplest answer to both those questions is it's all over the place. Right. And that, and that's what makes it, it challenging is when, you know, how people think about shoes in general. Right. I mean, I remember my dad and, and probably a lot of our dads had a, a brown pair of shoes and a black pair of shoes. And that was it. Right. And that's what their closet consisted of. And there's a lot, I think most of us have evolved past that, but there's still, 
you know, that idea of I have a brown pair, I have a black pair. When those wear out, I get something new. Now there's other people that really on the other end of that spectrum have understand like the versatility and having multiple pairs of shoes in their closet, just as you have multiple pairs of pants and it's become part of their, their wardrobes ensemble. And, and they start dressing from the shoes up and, um, you know, they spend a lot of time researching their products and, and researching the brands and finding out where they make their leathers and how they construct their products. And so you have this gambit of, of people that it's an afterthought. I've just got to have some stuff because I've got to wear to people that really spend hours and days and months researching the product they're going to buy. And, and we find that, you know, once we you know, get a customer that there's five to 10 touch points and they come back and they ask questions and they ask their friends and they ask their, their wives or their partners. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of this in the store of what it's going to look like. And so people really spend a lot of time when it comes to like a higher quality product, figuring out and trying to understand what they're going to get. Right. And so you have the, the, the total kind of spectrum with consumers, but then you also have the spectrum of consumers within the different price points. You just have some people that, that aren't going to spend more than let's say a hundred dollars on a shoe ever. They're just, they're never going to do that. And you have to be okay with that. I mean, that customer is willing to spend a hundred dollars every year on a new pair of black shoes because the other one break, break down versus spending 250 to 300 on one that will last you, you know, five to 10 years. Right. Yeah. So and you just have that gamut. And I think the same thing goes for people's feet is it's all over the place. And when I was working in the golf side of Adidas, you know, we spent a lot of time studying people's feet as they move through the golf swing and you know, looking at, you know, some of the, the, how your feet respond when they're flat versus curled up and, and bunched in shoes and things like that. So, you know, people's feet are, are all different with their arches and, you know, if they've had injuries or if they're, um, you know, even, even over the last couple of years, we had, I was talking to our store manager the other day and she said, you know, I've got a lot of customers that have bought three, four pairs from us. And now they're coming in post COVID and their, sh their feet have changed a little bit and <laughs> wow. they're, they're now wide or they're a little flatter because they've been working at home and walking around in bare feet or, or house slippers. And so we're even seeing some evolution there. And so there is an aspect when you're a shoemaker, you try and do everything you can to build a product, but sometimes people's feet just don't work for the stuff you make. Yeah. And, and you also have to accept that just like you have to accept that, that your, your price point's just too high for some people, regardless of the value or the quality and that you build into your products. Right. And in a little bit, I, I have some questions on sort of your lasts and, and what feet they're good for and all that kind of stuff, which is fascinating when you look at your website. There's a lot of information about that on there, which is, you know, listeners can can check out. And I wanted to stick with this idea of quality for a moment. How do you think about, especially in the boot space, right, sort of, and then when I say boots, I mean sort of the shoes and boots that you do, leather, high quality, quote unquote. But if you think about sort of the the arc of quality and um, endurance, which we'll also talk about, which is one of your sort of standby ideas, I think, from the company that things this is going to endure or can be resold, et cetera. How do you think about the, the sort of upward curve of price and quality in, say, a standard kind of boot that you're talking about? It's not truly a fashion boot, just a fashion boot. It's a, a boot that's meant to be worn, but... How does that go up? Like the hundred dollar price point, 200, 300, 400, like, does it get to a point obviously where you're, you know, it doesn't get that much better at some point. And what does that, what, what, what does that look like for you from where you sit? Yeah, well, for sure. I think like, like anything, there's, you know, there is a, kind of a maximum cost of what it would take to produce a product, right? Regardless of whether, you know, let's just exclude exotic leathers or, you know, some of those things. They're just fundamentally when you build a product 
the right way, let's say, and you use the best materials available and you construct it in the most durable way possible, there's kind of a limit on what that's going to cost to make. Now, take out of exuberant shipping costs and all that stuff. So you do have that curve where upside of that, those costs, you're, you're paying for marketing, you're paying for other things that a brand feels like they can demand um, because of the, the the position that that brand's in, right? And I think you're seeing a lot of transparency in the market with people just showcasing what it costs to actually make a product, right? And so, um, you know, we certainly look at that when we're producing our products and we've changed vendors a few times of what are the things that we want to build in? What are the things we're not willing to sacrifice on and, and build all of those costs kind of into our, you know, our portfolio of costs and, and then have to, to shape our prices based on that. And, and we certainly know that at the end of the day, like the consumer is really going to decide how much your product's worth. Um, so you might think you can sell a boot for a thousand dollars, but the consumer is really going to decide that your stuff's only worth whatever it, whatever it may be. But there's certainly that, that arc of, you know, really product cost to produce versus cost to market cost to do things like that, that, that brands can demand. So if I, if I said, okay, so, and I'm just speaking in the general from one of your boots, we'll talk about some specific ones in a minute, but if I said, okay, I really want to spend $150 more to make a much better boot. I basically want it to look the same. I want the same brand. But Brad, I want you to make it better for $150. Like, do you feel that that's a reasonable thing? Or you'd be like, well, $150 isn't going to buy you much more. Like, we're not going to put in, I don't know, like different leather. Or do you see the question? And I'm just wondering kind of yeah, how you'd sure. respond to that for so a standard boot. You know, you, you kind of have, uh, have the sense you're sort of in that 250 to 350 price point-ish. Yep. Um, which seems like a lot of these, you know, it, it seems like there's a settling of, of that range and then it kind yep. of, it, it, it arcs up pretty quickly from there. So I'm wondering what, what would you do if anything, or do you feel like, uh, that's kind of where we're landing and, and there's not that much that I would add. I'm just curious. Well, I mean, I would, I would happy to sell you any of our boots for $150 more <laughs> than they are currently priced. Um, yeah. So that, that's I where think, a scientist yeah, meets a business person. So exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I think again, going back to outside of adding some obscure, um, exotic leathers or materials, there's nothing. I mean, we, we do everything currently today, um, that we would do to produce, uh, the best boot that we possibly can, right? How we construct it, the outsoles we use, the methods we use, the leathers we use. I mean, we use Texas hides. So we, we source all of our, our leather hides from Texas and then we export them to our our facility down in Brazil to produce the leather down there because we know that those hides are the best hides for boots, right? So there's not a, a, a better leather supplier that we could find. Now, if, if we wanted to get into, and, and I was just talking to somebody again about this the other day of like, there is this, this, um, this synergy between like quality leathers that have the right thickness, right. To, to last and have long gel longevity, uh, uh, and, and meet the, the customer's expectations of a boot. I buy a boot. I expect to last five to 10 to 20 years. Right. So there's yeah. a, there's a certain thickness there, right. You can sacrifice some of that thickness for softer and, you know, these, these buttery feels a lot of times you get with Italian leathers, but the longevity isn't necessarily there. Right. So you can, we can go source a really expensive Italian leather. That's going to feel really soft and, and you're just, it's just going to hug your foot right away. That's very different than having a, a little bit thicker leather that is going to have a break in period. But once you, you know, wear it for uh, you know, a couple of weeks, it's going to really mold your foot and it's going to be there. That leather is going to last for, you know, decades, right? It's the, the soles you're going to have to resole. So I really think it's that, that kind of balancing act of the, the the materials and the quality you build. So there's not really anything that I would say that we would do to produce a, a boot. We actually used to, you know, our boots when I first came on, 
started at about 495 right okay and so over the we we lowered our prices about four years ago to get a little bit more competitive in the price and then we felt some some price compression as well going through the pandemic and so we really have settled into this sub 300 dollars you know, 295 for our best boots. And so we've sacrificed some margin and we haven't changed the way we built. It's just, that's kind of where we felt the market was for our type of product. And I, and I look at competitors in our space that some sell for less and some sell for more, but there's not anything different um, construction wise that anybody that, that makes a boot that's more expensive than ours, that's doing anything different than us. Yeah. In a lot of instances, they are, not making as good a booth it's just they have a, a better brand or a bigger brand and a a, a more well-known brand right right so a question about the challenges and i'm curious about the challenges to making say high quality boots and shoes like the type that you make and how that might differ from different types of footwear like what are your real difficult challenges that might be different than say other sectors and then also, are there things that vary as far as challenging challenges within your offerings of these kinds of boots are much more difficult for these reasons and these are different um, for other reasons? Good question. Um, I think the biggest challenge for a, a product like ours is that it's very expensive to make. You know, after you know spending 16 years making high performance, you know, athletic wear and, you know, being in the industry and now for five, six years in the leather goods. And you know, I think one of the, the fun things we do is we, you know, we buy a lot of competitor products and other things and we cut them open to see really? what's inside. Uh, right. Yeah. We, we, that's have, awesome. we have a saw, we, we cut, well, we've got some pictures on the website you can see, but we, we're very transparent with what's in our, in our products, right? We want people to know that, you know, when you buy a, uh, a helm product, the outsole, you know, the heel stack is actually leather and it's not cork that's got a leather wrap, right? And so I think one of the challenges is that it's very expensive to make products the way we do. And so as a small brand, when we buy a hundred boots, it's very expensive to, to buy those, right? And so if we also miss and something doesn't hit or um, the customers don't respond as well that we feel that pain a lot more. Um, it's, it, it's generally slower to produce this way. Um, there's a lot more lead times in, you know, taking leather from Texas and getting it down to, to Brazil. Um, the outsoles that we use are all crafted and take, you know, 30 days just on the outsoles. And so there's, a, there's a lot of those things that it's, it takes a little bit more time, just like anything that's, that's, that's crafted and it's high quality, it takes a little bit more time and it's more expensive. Um, I think one of the other challenges is part of the, the customer education around a product like ours. If you, if you are a boot guy and you've had Red Wings and Wolverines and, and you've worn these, you get a pair of Helm boots and you're, you're surprised at how comfortable they are right out of the bat. And you're used to having a break-in period with a product. I was never that that guy before I joined here. I wore, you know, sneakers for 16 years, and so um, had a couple of, you know, I had the the brown shoes and the black shoe for when, you know, I had to do something. And so there's something about that, you know, that step in comfort that when you put your foot in a shoe or a boot or anything that it's immediately comfortable, um, and that's a that's a different experience when you're talking about like well-made crafted boots that are meant to last 20 years that there is some work that's needed now we have certain products that we don't use that same thickness of leather in um you know that have a little bit more comfort and things like that but you know when you're talking about kind of the core of our business there is a there's an education needed with customers around here's a boot it's going to take you a few wears for it really to mold and shape to your foot um, but when it does, it's going to be the most comfortable thing you have, right? It's, you know, that, that baseball mitt that you had that you could barely close, but when you, you treat it with some oil and you wrap the leather band around it, like pretty soon the things, the thing's perfect. Like there is some work. And once you educate customers on that and, and they experience, like they'll never go back. But, um, if you've never done it, it's, it's, it's something different. 
Um, and you just kind of have to, to kind of battle through educating people on that, but also understanding that some people might not want that. They might not want to, to do that and, and that's okay. Yeah. So maybe in the sense of that educational vein, I wanted to ask a few questions about the boots, right? And, and kind of your uh, strategy in designing them and what those features are that people should understand both about boots in general, but especially about these ones that you're offering. I mean, maybe we can start with the lasts, right? Because we talked about the feet. You'd look down at your own feet, at least if you're mm -hmm. me, and I'm like, wow, those are really weird. Um, you know, not necessarily exactly the same size. Toes are sometimes longer in the middle, et cetera. So everybody's feet are different. I understand, at least from your website, that you have several different lasts, the 323, the 415, et cetera. I'm curious how you describe those lasts, like what what does the last mean and how do you apply those to the boots that you, that you currently offer? Sure. It's a good question. I mean, I think there's probably nothing more important to the shape of, of a boot than the last. I mean, it really is a huge part of, let's say the personality of that boot. And I think as we look at, you know, how our brands evolved and how, you know, where our customers have gone, like we've really tried to identify with the last that our consumers are looking for um, yeah. based on where we've gone. Right. And so I think I kind of look at this as two, there's really two different types of boot consumers um, when it comes to the last, there is more of a traditional Americana boot consumer that likes something that's a little bit more rounded. And then there's, you know, a, a different consumer that's looking for something a little bit more modern and a little bit more tapered, right? And so not not don't not pointy, not square, but just something that's a little bit more modern looking. And so we really focus on those two. And so as we're designing a boot or a shoe or a sneaker or something, we try and think of the personality of the customer that's really going to go into this. And so it's it's really unique when we look at the founder of Helm, who I took over from loves more traditional Americana looks. He loves black boots that have a more rounded toe. I, on the other hand, love a little bit more tapered and I don't own a single black boot, right? And so you just think of the personalities between the two people at Helm um, are very, very different. And so we kind of look at each project uh, a little bit differently and, and there's usually a specific objective around that project w that starts with the last. We're gonna create this project. We think it needs to have a little bit rounder toe shape and a toe cap, or it's gonna be a little bit higher and it's gonna go after this consumer and stuff like that. So the last really is where you start with everything. Um, and so it's, it's really fundamental to have a good perspective and have good lasts to, to leverage that, that you think your customers really can identify with. Cause you, you know, I wear a, if I wear a rounded toe boot and I look down, I don't necessarily like what I look, what I see. Hmm. I, it, for me, I really, the, a little bit more tapered modern look is really what appeals to me. And so if we go back to that confidence from the ground up and, and feeling confident about yourself, I have to look down and I have to see something that's a little bit more modern looking than that classic American boot but everybody's different yeah. and um, you know, you can't make something for everybody, but we do have a good balance between the, the different products and the different toe shapes. So does the toe shape that sort of more pointed, more rounded cater to different sort of shaped feet, or is it just the way the sort of end of the toe extends? Do you know what I mean? Like, so with my foot, would I fit into either one or is, is that, is that how yes. it works? Yes. I mean, okay. generally, I mean, there is some psychology with consumers where they feel that they own, their feet only fit into certain lasts, but both lasts are developed to have very voluminous shoe like feet, but also, you know, a little bit more narrow feet. And so we offer wides and, and all of our lasts and stuff to, to accommodate different types of shapes. But yes, each last should accommodate different types of feet. Um, you know, but kind of go back a little bit like everybody's foot different i mean i've heard people tell me that you know, nikes just don't fit their foot 
Uh, but Adidas are perfect. And I've heard people say, well, New Balance is the only, you know, sneaker that I can run in because, you know, so people have their perspectives and, and, you know, different shoes are perfect for different people's feet. But yes, in general, if you found a helm boot, all of the last would fit your foot. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I want to come back to the cross section where you've cut boots apart and sort of showing the different layers and pieces, especially on a helm boot. I'm trying to figure out like, what are all those pieces, right? Like, so you have a, a bunch of things in the, the sort of layer cake of the sole. And I'm curious if you can describe what's important about having all those different layers. And, and you know, again, I don't need the whole, <laughs> I, I know you could probably go pretty deep on that. Um, but I'm curious kind of what you would point us to, as important pieces to understand about that particular layer or group of layers that help you have a really good soul. Yeah, I think it is looking at kind of the inside of, of the soul. I mean, it's always one of the, the first pieces that I point to is outside of looking at the leather, right? The thickness of the leather and seeing that this is a grade A quality leather um, is looking at really how's the the outsole constructed because if you if you just assume right which which you can't do but with a helm product that we are using the best leathers that we can possibly use and that leather is going to last a long time the next thing that's going to to break down or cause you problems is going to be the outsole and so validating and showcasing how we build our outsoles is is a big part in in giving somebody the confidence to purchase a helm product versus somebody that they purchased from before right and that's a that's a big that's a hard thing to do right to to get somebody to change change from a brand that they they understand and so i that that leather heel stack right so showing people that when you when you open up the inside of a helm boot the heel there's four pieces of leather stacked together to make that heel right and those are going to cut those are going to really shape to your foot and they're going to soften versus having a piece of cork that's going to break down that has a piece of leather that's wrapped around it. Um, when we when we transitioned from our last factory to our current factory, the first samples they sent us had cork in the inside. And we immediately cut them open and, and found it and and just it wasn't it wasn't good enough for a helm product. And so we we made sure that they updated and and going forward all of our products have leather stacks. So I think it's just, you know, partly just being transparent about, hey, we're not hiding anything. We're we're using the best materials. We're using the best construction methods. And here, take a look, um, you know, and ask the questions of, of where our leather's from and, and how we produce it. Um, and we're going to be transparent and honest with you because we're going to show it to you. Yeah. And then the white sort of rubber layer, what's that about? So it is, it's become really a signature for us. Um, it's a really one of kind of the identifying pieces of a, of a helm boot. And, you know, so as you're out there and about and you see that white mid stripe, you're going to know that's a helm, helm product. It adds um, you know, a little bit more comfort and a little bit more uh, durability to the sole, right? You, you've got a pair of work boots or, you know, a really well-crafted pair of shoes. You don't want them to be too flimsy and, um, and too flexible, right? I mean, you don't want them to be so yeah. stiff you can't move, but so that adds a little bit of durability and a little bit of stability and foundation to to the product. So it is a functional aspect to it, but it's also really become kind of a, a unique design feature for, for a Helm product. I'm curious as well, when you think about, you know, this object, and I've been thinking about the meaning of objects a lot lately, you know, um, I had a conversation with James Cox a couple episodes ago about the watch that Paul Newman gave him and you know Paul gave him this Rolex Daytona in the 80s and James wore it for like 30 years for everything construction the whole show and then of course it went on to become this this icon watch but it was a nice watch when Paul Newman gave it to him and he just wore it and you know I think that's one of the things that I feel like both from a sustainability standpoint from a you know I think just uh, um, an outdoors standpoint, like I don't mean just like hiking the Appalachian Trail, but I just mean using a product 
and using something and having it become part of your lifestyle, I think it's really important to consider. And that's, again, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because it seems like that's part of what you hope to do. And I'm curious if you could sort of describe the life cycle, what you hope the lifetime of one of your boots is, not only in years, but what does that look like? And, you know, if one got a pair of boots right now, like if I just put a pair on, a new pair, how would you both hope that I would use it and then imagine that it would, you know, exist over time on my foot? I think partly the reason I'm asking that is that you look at reviews, right? Reviews are, can be important, but they all say, oh, these boots are great. Like, I don't mean just on your website, but just people write them like the week or two after they get them. And and then you don't really have the two-year, the five-year, the 10-year reviews, um, which I think are kind of what we're talking about. I'm, I'm curious how you would map that out for what you hope for. Yeah, no, I think it's 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 really important to understand that kind of life cycle. And we, we always say like our, our product's built to be worn, right? Our product is built to endure whatever it is that you want to do in that product. We're not a, we're not a, a extremely expensive fashion booth that's built to be, you know, to be stored in your closet and just brought out on special occasions, right? We are built to be worn and whether that's, out and about, whether it's every single day or whatever that may be, like it's it's very different for every every customer. But I think it's you know it's like a nice bottle of wine, right? Like what's the point of having a nice bottle of wine if you're never going to drink it, right? right? It's the um, you know uh, it's interesting you talk about watches because you know I used to be a big huge fashion watch guy, and then I kind of got to this point where I I was worried about wearing watches, and my and my life's kind of evolved with two small kids and activities that I I didn't really want to have a watch that I have to take off. And so I went and found a watch that meets the, the fashion needs, but is a watch that I do everything with. I go swimming, I ski, I do yard work. It just never comes off. Right. And so similar to a helm product, like we build these to be worn, right. And they're, they're supposed to be beat up and taken on your trips and uh, trudged around whatever it is that, that you're doing. And the helm helm product should be with you. And I, um, that's a big part of, of what we talk about is like, not only are we going to build the quality to last you 10 years or whatever it may be, it's also that they're going to look good in 10 years. Right. So it's the longevity of the style. And, you know, we've been around for 12 years now. Right. And so we've seen a lot of this come through and, and because we, we resole our boots. Right. And I think that's one of those fundamental things like if you're if you're looking for a quality pair of footwear and especially a, a boot or shoe and it's not resolable that it, it's not necessarily built to last right it is it is built to be have one life cycle where we the the products we see coming through for resoles they could be somebody wearing them on a you know a, a job site working beating them up not doing anything to them you know, they, no condition or no cleaning and they are just beat up and he needs a resole to somebody who's worn them every day in the office and condition them some twice a month and, and shines them and, and polishes them. It's just the soul is just ready for a new life cycle. So, yeah. you know, the, the gambit is, is all over the place of how people use them. And, and the expectation is that that boot, however you want to do it, if, if you know, if you take care of it and if you, treat it well and you get it resold when it's supposed to, like you should be able to go through three or four resoles in, in wow. every product. Wow. You know, if, and we've, we have them, like we have, you know, people that are on their fourth or fifth resole and they've never done anything to them. Now the boots, it's not how I care for my boots um, or, or my shoes, but they love that they've broken them in and they beat them up and they've scratched them and they're theirs and, and they're super comfortable. Um, and so it, that's kind of the expectation you have when you when you spend you know money on a quality product you expect to put it through the ringer and you expect to you know take it and travel in europe for you know 30 days or you know, a couple of weeks and it to to last and um you know when it's time you resell it and it's got another you know two years three years to it yeah i love that idea of just you know getting something like that putting it on your feet and just wearing it you know as you said condition it here or there but be able to really use it 
and see what that's like and and watch the evolution take place it's it's Mm -hmm. i think where it's good for us to go more in general um especially for people who want to be active and be outside or you know sometimes in the office but also walk the dog and all those kinds of things it's nice to have things that can you know go that whole distance rather than having to have a whole bunch of different things for individual purposes and would you say that that's your boots can do that oh 100 percent. yeah yeah it seems like I mean, it. I mean, again, I'm coming from the outside, right? I don't, I don't know from personal experience, but it does seem like um, you can walk in them for good distances. They not hike; they're not hiking boots necessarily, but you can keep them on your feet for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I've I've definitely got you know my pair of dad boots. You know, it's kind of my go-to pair on the weekends, and you know that I that it just so comfortable that it's it's hard to put anything else on but i also you know i have things that are a little nicer and i have a, a friend who's in europe right now and he just texts me from from europe being like i need a resole i'm like well <laughs> can't really help you help you right now man when you get back we, we'll, we'll take care of you but yeah he's like it's my my third trip to europe with these they just got hundreds of miles i he's like i just can't be without them um, but they're, it's time. Right. And so that's exactly it. He's taken them everywhere. Um, and, and they've been his travel companion and, um, it makes it easy to travel too. You got a good pair of boots that you can wear with jeans or chinos or, you know, whatever it is like, you know, save, save the room and the luggage right through. I mean, when I travel, I, I wear a pair of boots that I'm going to wear for the trip and then I pack my running shoes and that's, that's really it for footwear. And it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. So can, a, a couple of uh, clarifying questions. First of all, what are the dad boots? My dad boots are my loose. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then what was the watch? So my watch is the, uh, it's a Sunto. Okay. I think I'd saying that right. S-U-U-N-T-O. Okay, cool. And nice. it's You're happy with it? Per- uh, it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Cool. I, I've disconnected all of the the notifications. So it does exactly what I want from a athletic performance perspective, but then it also kind of looks cool and, and tells time. And that's yeah. really all I want out of it. Right. And you're not worried about, you know, bashing something on the stroller or the, well, I don't know if it's still stroller time, but <laughs> you know, it's, well, we're, we're just, we're past stroller time, but we're uh, into getting crashed into I mean, all sorts right. of things. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, so turning a little bit to the specific boots that I'm, you know, interested in looking at on the website, kind of helping us understand the the style, especially. Mm-hmm. I want to start with, you know, you make the shoe called the Bradley, right? And given this question is coming from someone who doesn't have a, a shoe named after him <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and won't ever, I'm curious, how is it to have a, a shoe named after you? Like, what's your relationship with the Bla- Bradley shoe like? Well, it was, it was the first shoe that we had ever done. And, um, this is, you know, one of, one of my challenges when I first came on was, okay, we, we, we're making boots, right. But how do we diversify our assortment a little bit? And how do you, how do you own more of the closet, right? If, if, if a guy loves our boots, right, he's also going to be interested if we offer other things. And so just challenging the team to come up with a, a shoe that is a helm product that checks all the marks there. Um, you know, it's a modern version of a traditional dress shoe that, that is, you know, built in with the same methods that it makes that, that we use to build boots with that's going to allow it to last uh, quality wise, but also design wise. So that was kind of the challenge. And, um, off they went and, and they nailed it. Um, so that was a, I also had a, a pair of pants named after me after from a apparel company that year. So it was a big year for me that I. So how does that work? Like, cause how does one get in on that? You seems like you're like, <laughs> how, why do you have pants named after you? So I'm, I'm friends with a, a guy who owns the apparel company okay. and I was, I sat on his board and oh, we office together when I moved back and he kind of said, Hey, well, why don't you wear any of our pants? And I, and I wore a lot of his shirts and I said, cause none of them fit. They're too baggy or they're, you know, they just, you don't, you don't make a pant that I feel like is the modern, a modern Chino. Um, and so I gave him some examples and, um, 
he went back and and they produced the the Bradley pan. And wow. so okay. it was uh it was kind of a fun year. Where I had a shoe named after me, um, and a a pant named after me. But it's the the naming convention is is a lot of fun because we all every product is named after somebody, and that's somebody that is important to us or as individuals within the company or um, has been important to us as an organization. Um, you know, the Charlie, my daughter's name is Charlie. We have oh. a Charlie shoe. Oh, my cool. son's name is Declan. We have a Declan shoe. Um, Mallory, who our brand manager, her son's name Ryder. Um, the Wilson's named after Brock. Um, you know, so everybody, every shoe and boots is named after somebody. And, and we really kind of think hard and, and long about, the personality of that shoe and how yeah. it matches with somebody that's important in our life. Right. It's just, so. I think it's awesome. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have that and understand that the, the brand and effort isn't um, behind this curtain, just a bunch of people in a boardroom, you know, figuring out how can we make money, right. It's people trying to make shoes and working together to do that. And these are the people. So I, I think it's neat. Um, so a little bit about your offerings. I wanted to ask about a few specifics on, you know, kind of the boots and like, what are the differences? But I wonder if even at the beginning of this, like, can you point to something that you feel like brings all the footwear together? That's like a design ethos or kind of through line, like what makes a helm shoe boot identifiable? Like what, what do you feel like in a new offering that it has to have x y or z or or is there something that kind of brings it all together sure i think outside of the the white midsole which is a very easy identifier for a helm product really we approach every project with the mindset of modernizing a classic right we're not we're not looking to um show up in New York fashion week with boots that, that grab headlines and, um, you know, have short life periods and chasing fashion cycles. We're really interested in modernizing classic footwear. That's going to look and be just as relevant in 10 years as it is today. It should be cool today, but it should also be cool in 10 years. And so finding that balance of the little things that you can do, to a classic work boot, right? And and that might be just modernizing the last, like we talked about. So, you know, a consumer that's worn boots for 10 years and, and probably has owned a couple of Red Wing Iron Rangers and and they've just gotten to a point where they're looking for something a little bit different in their life and, and Helm can really fill that need of, it's still a, a work boot, but because of the way we designed it and because of the outsole we use and the, and the last we use, it's just a little bit more modern and a little bit more sophisticated in the look that allows you to probably dress it up and dress it down. Whereas some, you know, sometimes you, you really can't dress up some, some boots. And so I think that's really the philosophy and that, that comes about in, in different ways depending on the project. Right. Yeah. It seems like that makes a, a lot of sense when you look across the offerings and across the boots that you produce. I wanted to start with the Hollis, um, and I wonder whether you feel like that's, let me put it this way. I look at the, the different boots. And I think that's kind of like not exactly in the center, but it, it seems like it's even if it's just off center of kind of the range of things that you produce, but seems like a pretty standard sort of work a day boot, right? That you could wear for, you know, walking the dog in the, at, at the office, et cetera. It has the, 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 lug i don't know what you call it mini lug sole um what if how would you respond to that would if i were kind of coming to you and saying like that seems like that's kind of the right pretty close to the middle does that make sense to you or or is that not kind of how you think about that where that particular boot fits i think you nailed it and and when i was talking just now about you know modernizing kind of a a, a classic you know, American work boot, the Hollis is exactly that. It takes a lot of the the functionality and the expectations of durability with that lug sole. But when you look at the toe shape, it's just a little bit more tapered and it's a little bit more modern, right? And so that is really the, you know, the perfect boot for somebody that is a boot consumer that's coming in, that's looking for kind of an everyday boot. You know, you kind of, you contrast that with the Zend, which 
is just a little bit dressier version of that 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 same thing, right? It's the same last. It doesn't have the toe cap. It's got a, a, a little dressier sole. So, you know, when people come to me and ask me, okay, I'm looking to get a pair of boots, you know, I ask them a couple of questions that, you know, what are you looking for? How do you want to wear it? And and it's either the Hollis or the Zen, you know, 95% of the time that I, I recommend to people. Whether you're looking for something a little bit more casual with that lug or something a little bit more dressier with our with our fine line sole, those are really kind of the perfect examples of modern dre- modern dress boots. How do those soles wear differently? I mean, they're not going to. I mean, you're not going to notice them in terms of walking around and wearing, but they are going to provide different things. That lug sole is going to provide more traction. Um, it's going to probably have a little bit more dur- durability and longevity just because it is a thicker piece of rubber. Um, whereas the fine line really is our answer to a dress sole. You know, we used to have full leather outsoles, um, but they wear out quickly. And if you've ever taken a pair of leather soles and anywhere that's wet or something, you slide all over the place, right? So you've got to kind of scrape them up and, and get some traction. So the fine line, it has that dress low profile but we've added the rubber into the middle of the forefoot and also on the heel just for more durability in the areas that you're gonna you're gonna beat them up the most. And so uh, I'd say that the primary difference really is the aesthetic that you want, right? There is like where you live in the winter, you probably need a boot, right? You need a boot that's going to have some traction when yeah. you're sliding around on the ice. You know, in Austin where Helm's located and and even here in Portland, Oregon, right? Like you know, I don't, we don't get a lot of snow, but it's wet. So in the winter, I wear the Hollis a lot in the summers. Um, or if I'm traveling to Austin, I wear the Zend a lot. So it's a lot of with those is really going to be the, the preference and look. If you, if you don't have the, the functional need for traction because it's cold and snowy or wet, it's really what, what type of look you want. You want a little lower dressier profile or do you want something a little bit more casual with the look? And so those are the ones, those obviously for listeners, those are the ones that go up over the ankle and are sort of a standard boot height. I'm curious if you go sort of more toward a, a true work boot, you've got, you go to the railroad, right? Which I would imagine is, you know, less of, you probably sell less of those, right? But that's like a true work boot. Is that, is that correct? That's what it looks like to me at least. Yeah, okay. you can look at, you know, the railroad, the Marion and the Molars, And those are a, a lot of the products that we used to create um, with our, our made in USA products. And so right. we've, we're, we're no longer producing at that factory anymore. And so those are kind of at the end of their life in terms of those specific products, but we, you know, we have you know, new products coming down the pipeline that, that meet those needs, but those are very much a, traditional work boot um with the toe shape etc right and you know it seems like as far as the the what i'm describing sort of thinking a lot about is those boots that you can kind of put on every day and you know wear to the office wear around the house you know kind of do a lot of things with those versatile ones where you know some of those boots that are even more um, your Iron Ranger style, right, is is a little less so. I've never had a pair, but I think those, you know, are a little bit more like a work boot that you're wearing, which is is a heavier, heavier uh, structure. Okay, so you mentioned I, I wasn't going to ask you about <laughs> Zen, but like, I mean the Lou. I'm sorry, the you mentioned it being a dad boot, et cetera. What? How does that one wear? I, I again, I. I'm just curious because it has a very different soul. Can you describe the soul briefly and like why do, why do you call it your dad boot? Well, because I'm a dad and I, <laughs> it's what I wear when I'm just bouncing between activities and things yeah. like that. It is, you know, it is, I'll, if, if, a, if a customer comes to us and says, hey, I've only worn sneakers, I love the comfort, but I, you know, I need to just, I need something that's a little dressier, but I don't want a dress boot. I mean, the Lou is, is perfect for that. It has you know, more of a sneaker sole. Um, and the comfort, I mean, my Lou boots after five years now, um, are way more comfortable than any sneaker I've ever had. So they are just I mean, the leather, the sole, I mean, they're about ready for a resole. Um, it is just the most comfortable boot you could possibly put on. There's 
zero break in. Um, and they just give you a little bit more casual of, of jumping around on the weekend uh, type vibe. I mean, they're great with, with jeans. No, I personally wouldn't probably wear those if I've, if I've got, you know, a meeting or, you know, a board meeting or a meeting with, you know, whoever it is that you know, I'm flying out to meet, I'll usually travel with my, my Zins or my a Bradley or, you know, something that's a little dressier, but um, you know, that's just kind of my, my everyday boot. If I'm, I'm running to the market or, you know, going to pick up the kids or we got soccer practice or whatever, that those are just kind of my, my go-to boot where I used to, you know, I used to throw on a sneaker, you know, even, even before when I, when I had, you know, boots, like, I would just, I'd slip on my sneakers and I just slip on those. Interesting. Yeah. It's, in, I, I wouldn't have pegged those as sort of a, an alternative to sneakers, right? When you, when I looked at them and I've never had a boot that's like that before. So that's, that's an interesting point. I never thought of it um, as being th that alternative, but it's cool. It does look comfortable though. The other two that I really wanted to ask you about are the Pablo and the Declan. I am curious for example, with a Declan, how does that wear as far as like walking, et cetera? Some chuckas don't lace over your foot very well. They're very loose and, you know, harder to walk in, et cetera. I'm just curious kind of how you've designed those. Are those more of a casual slip-on style chucka? Are they kind of something that you would walk long, you know, have on as more of a, a shoe? Like what do you intend for those to, to be? It, it's definitely not a, a slip on um, kind of in and out. It's it, it's a it's a a very substantial boot. It's um, and so it locks you in, and it's it's built to be worn. And um, you know, it is a certainly a traditional chuck up pattern, um, but we built it like a boot, right? So it's going to have the same thickness of leather and longevity, and the same outsole as the Zen and stuff. So, oh really? Okay. We certainly, yeah. it yeah, it's it's built to be to be worn, and um, we find a lot of customers that come to us who have only owned shoes and have never had a work boot. Like this is the the easiest transition into boots from somebody who's only had shoes is is a good chucka, right? It's 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 classic. They're you know, they're a little lower. Um, it's a little easier for people to understand how to style them. Um, they're a little bit more comfortable. And so this is a, a key, a key product for us is getting, getting customers from shoes in, into boots. And, uh, we've got a new one coming out that we just, uh, finalized a new, a new Chucka. So oh, really? fortunately, yeah, unfortunately the boot that we named after my son is going away, uh, here in the next three months and we'll have a new one coming out. That's, that's beautiful. It's even even more comfortable um, that we're really excited about. Oh, so the Declan's going away? The Declan is is going away. I see. Okay, but yeah, you'll well, in the next few months you'll have a new a new option. Oh, cool. Um, but you know, so those are going to be part of your profile, but just a slightly different sort of chucka style. Cool. Yeah, and it's kind of like you know, even though we we approach this with modernizing a chucka boot we felt like we could do more. And so like, what else could we do to make it more comfortable and, and more modern? And, you know, what are some small little details that we could do? And, and I think we've done a, done a good job and I'm really excited about it. Wow. Cool. And then the Pablo, I don't know where that fits in sort of the, you know, the life cycle of that particular boot, but that's a really different one, right? Cause it has a, it only has a zipper up the inside which is a really different style boot. I'm wondering like one, are those sort of also, where do those fit as far as their where they are in their life cycle as a as a product and then also kind of how they work right it it it's not a kind of boot i've ever had obviously if it's just a sort of fashion boot i could see it working and if it fits well fine if not but you're trying to produce boots that are like you know wear a long time etc so how do you create a well fitting boot with a zipper it's really challenging um and a lot of factories won't do it um and and can't do it and so it's we searched long and hard to find a factory that that could do it originally um and then at some point that factory lost their ability to do it uh, we had 300 boots that were delivered of the pablo about four years ago and five of them passed our inspection i mean oh it was God. it was crazy and so um the pablo boot when you certainly look at the aesthetic is very very different and so what we find, you know, the ease of getting a zipper boot on and off for the traveler, um, 
they really respond to this product. But it also goes back to you know the toe shape that's appealing to you, right? If for me, like I really like having a product with laces in the in that toe profile. There's a lot of customers, whether they've worn cowboy boots or loafers or you know products like that, you know, they really love the clean look of not having any laces. And so that's kind of how we develop that of, you know, the option for the customer that wants to look down and not see anything. Um, and then the ease of having a zipper that you can just zip it on and off, um, you know, back before TSA pre-check and all of those things, <laughs> a lot of us that travel a lot, like, you know, taking your boots on and off, like we'd have customers that would come in and, and, and had bought the Brown and came back and like, I need the black now because they're just so easy to travel with and get them on and off. And they just really like, how they are definitely a modern boot, um, but they still kind of tie back into the heritage of some of the things that they they liked when they wore, you know, cowboy boots, right? You know, being a Texas brand, we get a lot of customers coming in that have worn cowboy boots over the years, um, and so this is something that they really identify with. That's that kind of more appeals to that that side of them. Yeah, yeah, it's a really unique combination of sort of more of like that kind of boot, but also it looks a little bit like a you know, a, a Chelsea or something, which is another question I had. You don't have a Chelsea, a, a true Chelsea. Is that some, is that by design? Is that something you just haven't done or where, where does that fit? Um, we have had them in the past and I'll honestly say we didn't do them well. Um, and we, you can see there's one sneaker called the Morris, which we did as, as a collaboration with, with a hospitality group called Death & Co. Which is a which is a Chelsea sneaker, but um, we have one coming out. I think in September this year, you know that that I love, and so it will it will really I think meet the needs of the Pablo customer and the Chelsea customer because we've done them in the past. We've I think we've made a couple of design assumptions that probably were incorrect, and okay. I think we've 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 talked to our customer and we've listened, and I think we're going to get it right this time. So. But a Chelsea boot is is really important. Um, it's kind of a you know like a Chucka boot. It's 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 one of those products that you, you have to have, uh, but you have to do it well because it's also really hard to fit correctly. Um, you know the shape around the foot and making it so you can get them on and off without too much trouble. There's a lot that goes into making a Chelsea boot work, um, and there's some companies out there that do a really good job in it. So if you're going to go up against of them and offer an alternative you know you've got to be you've got to put something out there that's more compelling than what they're offering right yeah and you feel like you've got that coming out in september you said yes awesome okay last question and again i really appreciate you spending the time and, and really going through this thoroughly with me i i'm curious kind of where you've talked a little bit about some of the things that are coming out and where you hope to take things like other things you're excited about other design options or things that you would hope to do at some point or just kind of pie in the sky designs that you've thought of before where where do you see things going and what what are your hopes for creating new um, footwear it's a great question i think um one we're excited to for the most part that that we feel like the pandemic impact on our business is is hopefully in the rearview mirror um as you as you see like a lot of our products are are built for people doing things and whether that's going to the office or traveling and, you know, weddings and events and all of those things. And, and so those things are happening again, which is, which is good for us. Um, I think the thing we're really focused on is, is continuing to um, modernize what we see as open categories that we don't currently have. Right. So I think the Chelsea boot is a, a perfect example of us taking our time and getting it right. Um, and then looking what other what other categories we're not quite in. I think there's a lot of potential with more boots, like, but there's also a lot of potential with shoes as well, right? So you look at the Bradley, we've got the Nils, which we're phasing out, and there might be a few still on the website, but you know, again, the, you know, the we didn't probably nail that project like we should have, and so taking our time to get those right. So I think there's a lot of potential in the footwear, the footwear side with shoes. Um, you know, some more sneakers and then really rounding out and having a complete assortment of, 
um, you know, the, the basic categories that you need to have in boots. Um, right. So continue to do that. And then, you know, we've talked long and hard, like we have a lot of um, women that are fans of our brand. And so looking at exploring women's footwear and, and what does that look like? And who is the, you know, the women, the, the female helm consumer and stuff like that. So I think that's a huge opportunity as we look to expand and, and grow and, and um, kind of push for, push the brand forward. I mean, we're a, we're a 12 year old brand that, that really is in, you know, year three or four, as we've looked at like the, the iterations of our company. And so we're still in the infancy of a lot of these things. And, um, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't get too reckless um, and, and try and get too big or try things that are out of our, our core competency uh, yet. I'm curious for um, you know the listener who's interested in the in the brand or learning more about it. How would you, as the CEO, like if I came to you or a, a listener came to you and say, "Hey, Brad, like how how would you suggest I find out more and kind of go about exploring this brand and and you know thinking about what's right for me?" I think a, a good way is I mean obviously you can spend time on the website and we've got a lot of content and blogs and. I think if you if you want to know more or what's right for you to reach out and ask us. I mean, we are a a team that's pretty dedicated to to service, right? And so, send us an email and, and explain kind of what you're looking for and and kind of how you what brands you know now and and we'll we'll put point you in the right direction. We'll get you sized the right way and um, we'll get you in the right colors and models and based on kind of what you're looking for. Because I think a lot of people. You know, we, we have we have a store in Austin, and so people come in and they think they want one thing, right? But then they get in there and, and through some questions and some fittings and stuff, and we find them in a completely different, different, different style. And so I think being comfortable to ask the question, right? Like, it's just like any product, right? You know, unless you live it and breathe it every day, like there's somebody out there making that product that knows more about it than you and ask the question. Yeah. Um, you know, people love to talk. I mean, I... I still answer a lot of our, our customer service emails. And when I'm back in Austin, I love being on the floor selling products. And, and so ask, ask us, you know, if you have a question, just reach out and we'll, we'll get back to you right away and we jump on the phone with you or, or whatever it may be. Well, thank you for that. I, again, I think one, I want to thank you for being on the podcast and talking to us, sharing us, you know, with us so much about both Helm, but also what it's like to think about footwear and think about especially footwear that's, you know, both uh, has endurance, as you say, and has some style and um, real interest and, and is made in a way that's has some high quality. So I appreciate that. And you've also, I think, shared with us already a, a lot of different ways to think about how to approach, how to get into these things. And um, it does seem like, you know, both the store and the, your email is a good way for people to just reach out and, and see. So I encourage people to do that. I really wish you luck with the new models. We'll be looking forward to what's coming out and uh, all the stuff we can see. And I, again, I really appreciate you being on the dog watch. Well, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun to chat and I love the curiosity and, and the questions you came at. It's, it's good for, for me to start thinking them kind of outside of my day to day. And I love your curiosity and, and how you think about uh, products like, like Helm. Great. Thanks again. And, and good luck with the new offerings. Thank you. Thanks again to Brad for taking time to share so much with us today about quality boots and the Helm brand. Our music credit is Whiskey on the Mississippi by Kevin McLeod, courtesy of Creative Commons. Until our next shift, this is Michael Canfield thanking you for joining us on the Dog Watch. Dog Watch.